welcome to our service this evening and welcome to those who are with us on live stream as well. Uh, I'll just read a few words from Psalm 34, verse 15 to 19. <clears throat> the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of all them. Let's pray. We thank the gracious God that we can come to the throne of grace this evening and uh, come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, we come in the name of our uh, risen Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank thee for his shed blood and for his risen life. And we thank thee that uh, even this morning we've been able to remember the Lord's death until he comes. We thank thee for his broken body and for his shed blood. And thank thee that we can, even this night, shelter under the blood of the Lamb. And we pray that you would indeed be in our midst as we gather around your word this night. Uh, speak to us by the word and the spirit and sanctify your solemn dealings unto us. And we pray that you would lift up the light of your countenance upon us and give us peace. So bless us now and help us to worship you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Our first song will be Christ is Made the Sure Foundation. Good evening. 
uh, the announcements for this evening. Just welcome to all here and live streaming. Apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, the Barnes just want to pass on uh, how grateful they are for their, everyone's love and support over the past seven to eight months. Uh, Emily uh, had her burial on Thursday and we had the memorial service on the Friday. Uh, and they just wanted to say, you know, the love of God's people has meant so much to all of them. Uh, session meets this week on Monday at 7 o'clock. Bible studies continue uh, at 9.30 on the Wednesday. They're looking at Job. 7 o'clock uh, at night, they're looking at the Gospel of John. And that one can be uh, attended by a live stream as well, I think. Uh, the evening studies um, can be joined by Zoom, sorry, not live stream. The Thursday night Bible study, we're looking at 1 Samuel, and that's at 7.30 of a Thursday. This week, the ladies' Bible study meets. Uh, they meet at 9.30 for a 10 a.m. start. Uh, Peter will speak also on Saturday the 11th of June at 8 a.m. on the life and lessons of Charles Simeon, which should be good, so please attend that. Uh, Pam Neuendijk's funeral will be on the 17th of June, which is a Friday at 11.45 at Warrenora at the Lodge, and her burial will follow that. And uh, Sam wants to just say a few words about the next ladies event. Hello, just on behalf of Talia, who announced this this morning, we have a ladies' lunch coming up on the 25th of June from 12 till 2, and we've got these leaflets at the back on the step um, ledge, if you'd like to grab one on your way out. Uh, the speaker is Emily Moritz, I think is how you say your name, and I'm currently reading one of her books that Harriet lent to me. Um, so she's speaking about how to live in the middle of your story. So if you can come to that, that would be wonderful. You can RSVP to Talia, all the details are on here. And this is at the, up the back as well, just a sign up sheet for helping out. There's not many uh, spots available. There's set up helper, bring bread rolls and butter and pack up helper. So if you'd like to do that, that's up the back too. Thanks. Okay, well let's open God's word together. Uh, the Old Testament reading tonight is coming from the book of Nehemiah, and we'll be reading the first eight verses of chapter 8. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, and verse 1, says, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law, and Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for that purpose. And beside him stood Mattahiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masiah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, Malkajah, Hashem, Hashbadanah, Zechariah, and Meshalam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Jesh also Jeshua, Barney, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akib, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Masiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peleiah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And this is God's word. Our New Testament reading tonight comes from the book of 1 Timothy. And we'll be reading 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the first seven verses.
1 Timothy in chapter 3, starting at verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. And this is God's word. As we come to prayer, we'll continue to pray, pray for Peter and Lynn and the So family, and also Peter Newendike, um, mourning the loss of his wife, and we'll pray for the family and the sick and infirmed. Um, and particularly, I think we pray for Jesus Cares Ministry. We heard a, a um, report from David Brooker this morning that he sent to me, and he had quite an um, interaction with a sort of gender neutral person on Saturday night, I think it was, and it was a great attack on the uh, Jesus Cares team. So, uh, but at the end of it, uh, praise God, um, this guy walked away um, subdued because the, the team sang Amazing Grace. And um, he walked away and said, God forgive me for I'm a sinner. So let's pray for this guy or uh, this person. So that was quite an amazing testimony that the team shared with us. So let's pray. Eternal God and loving Father, we thank thee that we can come to the throne of grace and find mercy to help us in our times of need. And we're reminded, O oh Lord God, that your word uh, is not bound uh, and the spirit will go where it listeth. And we thank thee, Lord God, that uh, your word is true and faithful and uh, it shall uh, not come to pass that uh, it shall go forth and touch the hearts of those who are dead in trespasses and sins. And we're reminded tonight of those who are who's suffering and those who are mourning and grieving. We uh, continue to pray for Peter and Lynn and, and the Snow family. And we also pray for Peter and you and Dyke and his family, that you would be gracious to them. And your word reminds us that the oil of joy for mourning is in your word. And so we pray that the unction of the Spirit on high would be upon them, that you would uphold them, that they would know underneath of the everlasting arms, that your word is true, that your word is faithful, that your word speaks to us all in our individual and uh, circumstances. And so we commit them all to you, O Lord, praying this time, uh, that they would not mourn without hope, but know uh, that their Redeemer liveth, uh, and that they will go to be with Christ, which is far better. And we also pray for those who are struggling at this time with infirmity and sickness, uh, we pray for Will Thomas and <clears throat> we remember Lynn and uh, Wayne and the family at this time too that you would continue to uphold them that you would sustain them through their uh, continuing treatments and uh, through their infirmities we remember <clears throat> Les McKinnon as well that you would be up upholding him in the twilight years of his life and even yet he can still bring forth fruit to your honour and glory so we pray for him, we pray for Don's mother as well so she, she may be able to settle into the nursing home and you would be gracious to her as well. And we're mindful, O Lord God, that uh, these, faith, these are faithful witnesses who have borne the heat and burden of the day and who have uh, been great witnesses to each and every one of us. We pray, O Lord God, that you would be with, uh, as we've heard, the Jesus Cares Ministry. We pray for David at Brooker and his team. We thank thee, Lord God, that you have intervened on this person's um, uh, outburst and we pray that you would indeed speak to it, her heart or his heart that you would convict and convince the soul in sin that lies and that they would indeed see that there is judgment to come and that God is in control we pray that the spirit would do, indeed do a mighty work and, and move in this individual's heart that she would come 
uh, to faith in Christ. And we pray for that work, O oh Lord, that needy work amongst the, the down and out and the poor and needy. We pray that you would be with them. Also remember Alex on holidays, that she might be refreshed and encouraged as she would come back to that work. And so we pray that you would indeed bless that work and be gracious to them. And we pray for your work in other parts of the world, for uh, the ongoing work in, in Nepal. We pray for that work with Pastor G1 and pray that you would indeed bless that work. We pray for the children that they might early in their years come to faith in Christ. And to this end, Lord, we pray that uh, you might overthrow the anti-conversion laws and that they might indeed be able to witness uh, without fear or favour of what man might say or do unto them. For the work in Myanmar, we pray for Tung Wee and his team. We pray that you would bless that work as well and strengthen them and build them up and be gracious to them. We remember Mick Alley and the work in Kenya and pray that you would uphold him and sustain him and grant him that physical strength to keep fighting the good fight and uh, being able to be light and salt in a, a dark world. We thank thee, O oh Lord God, for the work in the Middle East Reform Fellowship and for all those who are persecuted in that part of the world for righteousness' sake. And may the God of all grace and peace be poured out upon them, that they would be enabled to uh, be strengthened by the word and the spirit. We also pray for the work at Beechwood. We pray for Shane as he continues to undertake that ministry. We thank you for the ministry, Lord, that is ongoing and that we still have that opportunity to go in and to uh, counsel, to preach the word, to have the Bible studied and pray that you would indeed bless that work. And we also remember Shane. We pray that you would uphold him and, uh, and grant him a measure of health and strength that he might be restored once again to take on the work at Beechwood and here in the church as well. We also pray for the um, session meeting tomorrow night that you might be in our midst as we uh, would make decisions and deliberate upon things and we ask that you would be in our midst and help us to, uh, to be good witnesses and to be uh, leaders of the flock and so we ask that your mercy would be upon us even tomorrow night. We pray for the Bible studies this week too that you would be with us all as we gather around your word that you would speak to us by the word and that you would encourage us by the word. And so we pray your blessing upon that work and pray that it would indeed be used to the glory of your name. And so we ask and pray for the work in uh, Ukraine. We think of your people there, that you might bless them, that you would uh, watch over them and uh, protect them from the, the fiery darts of Satan, that you might indeed pour out your spirit upon those people there, that they would indeed be faithful uh, to the word. And we commit them to you, Lord, and thank thee and we pray that you might indeed overrule. We know that there is wars and rumours of wars, but we know that you can overthrow. And so we pray that you would turn back the tide of Satan and that your name would be honoured and glorified to the ends of the earth. And so we ask and pray that you would be with us now. We pray for Peter as he opens the scriptures tonight. May he be strengthened by the word as well. May the outpouring of the unction of the spirit be upon him. Give unto us ears to hear and hearts to understand and enlighten our minds and renew our wills and we pray that you would uphold us now and forgive all our sins for we pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. Amen. Okay, we'll sing our next song. Set up. 
Thank you, Jim. And uh, if you all turn with me to 1 Timothy 3, uh, that's where we're p- picking up uh, our series on 1 Timothy. Just uh, two things as an in- introduction, uh, before we get into it, uh, just to re- reiterate what uh, was already said, that we are, uh, the Barnes family, very grateful for your love and support over the past seven or eight months with uh, Emily and um, uh, yeah, it, it's meant a lot to us. Um, expressions of sympathy and assurance of prayer. And last Friday, especially the women, uh, just left us a meal for the whole whole family. Uh, they didn't all get there. They all got, virtually all got to the uh, memorial service, but uh, straight after the memorial service, Caitlin, that's and my sister came down with COVID for the second time. Uh, so she's now in isolation. Uh, and so some of the So family didn't get there. And uh, Matthew had some of the same thing and he, he couldn't last long anyway. But the rest of us ate very well. Uh, but uh, it was it was terrific just to uh, get together, not have to think about doing anything except reminisce and try to encourage one another. But thank you very much. Uh, it has meant so much. And, and a second thing I should say, uh, more to do with the text. So if you turn to 1 Timothy 3, uh, this is the second part of, a, of uh, uh, two sermons that were meant to go together. You know, one week following next week. So you've probably half forgotten or fully forgotten what, what we did so long ago because uh, this was one of those Sundays where Emily looked like she was uh, going to die and we raced over there and by the time I got back he, he survived that day but by the time I got back I was in no condition to preach and so uh, Shane took over I think, led a prayer meeting and said some things so that was helpful um, but if you remember even before that uh, I should say this there was a, a, a sermon on the place of women in the church and, and I need to correct this I quoted Dr Edmund Clowney and the quote was right but in my mind it was to do with uh, women can teach but they cannot teach authoritatively and that's been quoted quite often by people who've interpreted to mean that you could have a, a woman on the preaching roster but when she preaches her, her, author- her preaching is not authoritative uh, which is a ridiculous position, but that's not Edmund Clowney's position. That's not what he was saying. He's quoted, but they use him to justify that. And I, I, I'm sure I left... I haven't listened to it again, but I'm sure I left you with the wrong impression that that was his view, and it's not what he meant. In my, he, he meant, essentially, that Priscilla and Aquila could go and correct Apollos and Priscilla, of course, the woman, and, and that's fine. You know, so you can... Say what you like out the front there, or the back, <laughs> uh, on, on the way out. Um, man, woman, or child, uh, that's that's fine. But uh, it's uh, it, that's what he was supporting uh, and saying was, was was valid. So I'm sorry if I left people with the wrong impression. I'm sure I did. Uh, so let's now try and leave you with the right impression, <laughs> and, and we'll get on to one Timothy three, and, and this is part two of this. Uh, section here uh, on the eldership. So let's pray first. Father, I pray that uh, you'd be with us. I uh, pray that you'd minister your word to us. It speaks to us as individuals. It speaks to us as a church, even the organisation, the structure and the polity of the church uh, of gifts that you give and qualifications for those who hold office 
uh, help us now. We, we ask that we might read and hear uh, with understanding and that uh, this might be a uh, help to us, uh, not only as individuals, but as those who are part of the body of Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Well, just to remind you where we, we got up to, uh, the, we, last time we looked at the principle that a man can desire or aspire to the eldership. Uh, if you go back to verse 1, a trustworthy saying, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task, so he, that's a good work. But the church has to test this desire, uh, and that's why these qualifications uh, are set forth here. So there's two things. If someone, man does not want to be an elder, well, that, that suits that. That settles that, doesn't it? But if one does, the church needs to test it so far as it can. And then we also looked at uh, most of these qualifications have to do with character. If you read through uh, the verses, particularly 2 and, and 3, uh, and, uh, and then we'll get on later to the, the household, but the elder must be not susceptible in a number of areas. Uh, he mentions money and wine, and temper, he mustn't be bad tempered, and he has to be self controlled and, and gentle. So you're looking at the character of the man and saying he he will do good, he will not do damage uh, to the reputation of the elders or the church. And in addition, I, I, I do not think he's saying he must be married. Uh, some churches read it that way. I don't think he's saying that, but if he is married, literally he is a, a one woman man. So uh, he, he's, he's married to one wife and he must be able to manage his children. Uh, so if you're frightened of his children because they're likely to destroy the place, uh, he's not your man because that is kind of a little church. If he can't manage his household, well, how can he manage a bigger church? So that, that's what we looked at last time. So there's, there were qualifications that we looked at. Now, I want to pick up just the last three uh, today, they're not in, in, in order, uh, but just to round out this study. And the first one that we're looking at uh, today is that he must be able to teach, and that's in verse 2. This is not so much character, but gifts. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable. Uh, they're all of, of, to do with his character. And then he says, able to teach. So he must be able to teach to. Be skillful in, in teaching, such as George Knight translates it. And of course, there's a, a sense when every Christian is a teacher. Uh, every Christian should be able to teach. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 5, verse 12, uh, the author is down on the Hebrews, the, these Hebrew Christians, these Hebrews have become Christians, and, and they're not as they ought to be. Uh, for he says, though by this time you ought to be teachers, now, he doesn't mean the whole church consists of teachers and nothing else. That's not what he means. But teachers in an informal way, uh, capacity to, to uh, explain the gospel, explain it clearly. Uh, every professing Christian should be able to do that. If you can't do that, work on it. It needs, it needs to be something in your armory. Uh, so by this time, you ought to be teachers in that sense. And you need, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk not solid food, and he's criticising them there. But there is a distinct office of uh, pastor, teacher, elder, overseer. They all seem to be referring to the one office, and this is a must. He, he must be able to teach. He, this is from Lawrence Ayres. Uh, an elder need not be a gifted public speaker, or an able teacher of the Bible to large groups, though both these gifts are highly desirable, but at the very least, an elder must be able to deal with people on a one-to-one -one basis, applying the word to the needs of the individual. And I think that's a somewhat of a minimalist view, uh, but, but uh, let me, I've quoted it. Uh, that's what it means to be able to teach. Uh, not every Christian is cut out for teaching in a sense of, of speaking to a group. There are some people who are very fine Christians, but they don't like speaking in public. Uh, they don't think on their feet well. It's not 
uh, something that they're gifted with and the spirit distributes his gifts as he wills and, and there's always room for growth so you can grow as a teacher uh, but there, there is a, a gift of teaching that the overseer must have now in this real world uh, there can be difficulties in working this out uh, so I'll tell you this example uh, which I may have referred to before but in 1758 good to go back in history and John Newton I mean you'd all know amazing grace we just heard a story uh, about the effect of this man's hymn you know, just last Saturday night no last night uh, John Newton preached his first sermon so he's been converted uh, and he's thinking of the ministry he's pondering the ministry uh, he's got ministry on my mind if you have that's his, that's his diary uh, if you haven't got that and you want it I'll, I'll give it to you that, that's, that's magnificent it, it, you don't have to read anything else it's so searching uh, but here he is um, he has the opportunity to preach for the first time he never preached before and it was at a, an independent chapel in Leeds it wasn't he became an Anglican minister but this was in a uh, an independent church in Leeds and, and he got up to preach and he lost his place which is always terrifying you know. um, I once preached a sermon when I preached the third point first by accident and then had to work out <laughs> whether I was going to confess this or, or work my way back and, and you know, act like I meant to do that all the wrong <laughs> I took the latter which is probably a little deceptive I suppose but it, at least I didn't waste 10 minutes by saying let's start again um, so it went th 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Uh, I haven't done that here. <laughs> but Newton lost his place, finally became so hopelessly bogged down, he, he said to the pastor, Baptist pastor, you're going to have to finish, I'm, I'm lost, I can't do this. <laughs> and and uh, the only thing I would say about that is that th that cannot happen too often before you decide that this man is not cut out for this, uh, he can be a good witness, he can be a very fine Christian, he can do a lot of good, he can write hymns. Um, but you shouldn't let him lose doing this too often if, if that's the first opportunity. The second one better be considerably better, uh, otherwise uh, you wouldn't be encouraging him. In fact, it was another six years uh, before he was ordained and he went to the Anglican Church. I don't know whether he thought that was easier or not. <laughs> Uh, but he was ordained there. Uh, the point I'd make is it can be difficult to evaluate whether a man has a gift for teaching, but the, the church must make that evaluation. And, and it's, it's, it's a loving thing to say, no. Uh, Newton, I think people recognised his godliness and they were keen for him to go into the ministry. And, and so they... Uh, after such a disastrous start uh, they did finally admit him uh, and to the good of course and then we, let me read from Titus at chapter 1 because this is part of being able to teach Titus chapter 1 these also are, are a set of qualifications very very similar to what we get in 1 Timothy 3 Verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And there's more detail there, not just able to teach, but we do have more detail about what he means by that. That's more onerous. It's, it's actually harder to contend with an opponent. Uh, and uh, David Brooker would have found out last night with someone who's yelling and screaming and, and, and you're trying to present the gospel uh, and, and just trying to keep your equilibrium in, in that sort of situation is difficult. And so it's a fair thing to, be, to ask uh, the potential elder, overseer, uh, whether he can demonstrate the deity of Christ. Can he, if the Jehovah's Witness arrives on his doorstep because he doesn't believe in the deity of Christ, or he, and they often say... You believe that Christ and God are the same person, and it confuses them if you say, No, I don't. And there's actually three persons in the one God here, the one essence, not one person. 
When Christ prays to the Father, he's not talking to himself. There's three persons. So he must be able to, say, demonstrate the deity of Christ and he's not thrown off when there's some cult member at the door who wants to sway him some other way. Or the way of salvation. That's, there's some, sometimes someone will ask you something and it's fair enough to say, I don't know, I'll get back to you on that. But if someone says, what must I do to be saved? Like the Philippian jailer says to Paul and Silas. And I don't say, well, well, we'll get back to you on that. I've just got to look it up. All right, that's got to be clear and able to demonstrate it. Now, he didn't need perhaps with the Philippian jailer. He was not looking for texts. Uh, he's not steeped in the Old Testament. Uh, he was right at the beginning. But a Christian teacher needs to know the way of salvation and explain it clearly. Uh, and the presentation of heaven and hell, these, these basic presentations of the gospel, he must be able to teach that and to refute those who reject those things, who come up with some other way of salvation, or, or who say there's no place, you know, heaven is in your own mind and hell is in your own mind and it's not a place for the state of mind. People who say things like that and be able to respond to that. Uh, I think also he needs to know uh, some idea how the Old Testament connects to the New. Because uh, this is a common thing these days. People will throw it at you. Uh, Acts 15, look at verses 1 and 2. Uh, some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's a salvation issue. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others uh, were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So there's the apostles there, that's the extraordinary office in the church, and the ordinary office of elder. There's also elders at this Jerusalem council. And the issue is, is circumcision necessary for salvation? And uh, people will fudge around it. They don't quite know how to answer it. And they, sometimes they say, oh, you know, it's there in the Old Testament, but it's not there in the New. And, okay, is the Old Testament from God? Of course it's from God. It's, it's the Word of God. Uh, and, and some of us almost got an evolutionary view that God evolved. Uh, he, what he is in the Old Testament, he's different in the New Testament. And that's not the answer. That's, that is going to lead people astray. Uh, so Leviticus... 12 verse 3 uh, it, it says on the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised so God speaks very clearly on the issue now why do they decide finally in Acts 15 that no it's not necessary are they overriding God and of course they're not it, it's, it's how the Old and the New Testament fit together and, and you see how this uh is a command for a time and there are other commands like that uh, we had the Lord's Supper this morning why didn't we not celebrate the Passover <laughs> well, the Passover was a command of God but one fulfills the other the Lord's Supper fulfills the Passover the baptism fulfills circumcision uh, and the, the, what we call the ceremonial law is all fulfilled that's why we don't carry out the rest of the sacrificial law in Leviticus I'm not out here wrestling with a bull or a goat or a lamb or trying to slit its throat. All right, let's finish. We declare about the Lamb of God whose sacrifice take away the sin of Jews and Gentiles. Uh, and so someone who knows the scripture quite well, and I've met people like that, know the scripture quite well, and they know a lot of scripture verses, but they may still get that wrong. Uh, and they can do a lot of damage uh, if they're let loose in, in a position of authority uh, but unable to explain how the Old and the New Testament fit together, how God is a God who uh, sets about in the fullness of time sending his only begotten son to fulfil all that's there in the Old Testament. The whole law is fulfilled in him and just to see how that what that means for various aspects of law. So the elder must not only have the knowledge, but there's some capacity to convey it. Some people know a lot of things, but they're not good at conveying it. Uh, yeah. 
Sometimes the worst lecturers are the, go the fellows who know most about what they're talking about. Uh, I'm not being flippant there, I just, as someone who's lectured a lot. Some of my best lecturers are on the subjects I don't know much about. Because uh, you don't get in the road of yourself. <laughs> Uh, whereas if you know a lot about a subject, it can be hard to get it together in a coherent way. If you're likely to get sidetracked, and there are all sorts of dangers there. And if a person is apt to do that sort of thing, or, or he, he doesn't he doesn't know how to connect with people, but he knows a lot, that he should not be an elder. He might, he might be able to teach, but he doesn't. He's not able to teach well in the sense that will help people. William Jay is a lovely sentence. He's a friend of William Wilberforce. Uh, the great thing is to forget oneself and to speak with seriousness and affectionate feeling. So if you can do that, uh, he's on the way. Some people get so nervous. They're like uh, John Newton at, the, at his first attempt. And, and they'll drop the ball. And they, they, maybe they'll, they'll always do that. They'll never relax in, in front of a a group of people to speak to them. And they, and they could do that a hundred times. It wouldn't make any difference. That, that John Newton's not in that category, but there are people in that category. Uh, and all Christians have a gift, but that doesn't mean all Christians are debated or all Christians uh, teach in an official way. Uh, some Christians do not think theologically. I, I'm, I've met people, I'm sure they're Christians, but uh, you know, they, they don't really love wading your way through the institutes. Uh, I think they should, but, um, you know, they just think in a different way. But they know the gospel, and they love the gospel, and they, they know what it is to be justified by faith in Christ, and, and they want to serve him. And we're all different, and that's a good reason. It's a good reason for that. Uh, but if they, if they don't think theologically... You know, it's difficult to be a, a, a teacher. Some are easily thrown off by a debater. They just don't like someone coming at them. Uh, none of us do, but uh, trying to interact with someone is too much. Uh, some might have other problems. You know, speech defect even can be uh, something that keeps us out. An elder must be able to teach. Uh, the Old Testament reading, Nehemiah 8 and, and verse 8. And verse 8 summarises it, doesn't it? They, they read from the book, from the law of God, quite probably the book of Deuteronomy. That's the book of the law that's being read here. They read from it clearly so the people could hear. If they didn't have a microphone, I've got a microphone. Uh, but these, these people didn't have a microphone, so they had to be able to project their voices and, and to do that well. And they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That's the basic thing. They, they, they take them through the text. That's the word of, oh, of God. If there's anything there that needs explanation, uh, not that everybody would understand everything, but they give the sense of what God is saying. They're explaining, this is the word of God. And, and that's what a teacher is to do. So he must be able to teach. So that's the first qualification there in this second list of uh, qualifications that we're looking at. That's verse 1 through 9. Now, the, the second one, if you go down to verse 6, is uh, he must be spiritually mature. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, the word overseer, that's the word that's back there in verse 1. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, that, uh, that refers to the job, the task. He, we have an overseer you know, of a, of a uh, construction, you know, building construction, overseer, foreman, that sort of thing. He, he looks over what's being done. Elder actually refers to the person, and it doesn't mean he's old, uh, no one is, uh, but he is mature in the faith. Uh, Timothy himself was compared to Paul Young. So you, you'll know, if you look down at chapter 4, still in 1 Timothy, uh, look at verse 12. Uh, Let no one despise you for your youth. Uh, now, oh, I think Timothy must have been well over 30, and, and, but anyway, 
Uh, Paul's quite an old man, and he's looking. Everybody under 40 looks young, and uh, so Timothy looks young to him. So let no one despise your youth. Perhaps we would not describe someone that old as a youth, but uh, the older you get, the more likely you are to do that. <laughs> That's what Paul's done here. And, and Paul did not wait uh, forever uh, before ordaining elders on his first missionary journey. Um, back in, in Acts 14, Acts 13 and 14 deal with Paul's first missionary journey. And he plants churches. He doesn't plant mission stations. He plants churches. But he doesn't do it immediately in the sense of ordaining elders. So if you look at verses 21 to 23, uh, it would when day, the day is Paul and Barnabas, had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned. So they had a preach and then they returned. Now the return, there can only be a gap of a few months. It couldn't be much more than that. But they returned to Lystra, to Iconium and to Antioch. Now they're places they'd already been to, if you go to chapter 13. And strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying... Uh, that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God and when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed uh, and so uh, when it says they must be spiritually mature they don't seem to put them on probation for years in fact I, I think this is probably a little bit unusual because it's, it's, it's done so quickly but nevertheless it is done very quickly here in Acts 14 normally to uh, ordain a recent convert is is dangerous. So, uh, one Timothy in chapter five, you know the the verse uh, verse twenty two. Uh, it says, "Lay hands uh, suddenly uh, on no man. Uh, do not be hasty in the laying of hands," which is the idea. Uh, and when Paul wrote to Titus. These are the pastoral epistles. Uh, what, uh, Titus had, was, was going to Crete. And one of the things he had to do in Crete, the island of Crete, was uh, to, to, to work on the polity of the church. Because in verse 5 of Titus 1, he says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into water and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So there's something going on. You wouldn't you like to know what was going on? But something was going. Some Christian work was going on in Crete, but there were not yet elders in the church. And Paul seems to have followed the policy of, well, wait and see whom God raises up. And so you, you ever come across churches where they say, well, look, we need someone, so we put someone in, uh, and uh, and then worry about whether the person's suitable or not. Hope for the best. And, and Paul doesn't do that. Uh, no, we, he, there's a work going on in Crete but if you attended church there you possibly only got uh, people reading the Bible and praying and not much official teaching and Paul's saying well we need to work on that and I'll leave that with you Titus you remain in Crete and part of your job is to appoint elders in every town now if you know anything about church history you'll know the great exception is he must be spiritually mature he must not be a recent convert he, uh, be, he must he, he must not lay hasty hands on a potential elder uh, you know, just, just wait see how he goes if he goes yeah you know, fills promise then then you ordain him but the great exception of course is Spurgeon and you know Spurgeon's story, Charles Spurgeon. Uh, you know, the great ba Baptist preacher of the 19th century in, in England. Uh, and and uh, I've heard a story, I've, I've heard people give lectures on him and say, uh, well, he was ordained in, in, at the age of 19, he came to the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Uh, he was ordained before that. <laughs> um, he was baptised in the River Lark at Ireland. 3rd of May, 1850, he was 16. Uh, and later that year, he moved to Cambridge and he preached his first sermon and he became the pastor of a small Baptist church with a Baptist name, Water Beach. Uh, 16, you, you call someone 16? 
to preach to you. And, you know, this is madness. You know, these Baptists, really. <laughs> they're crazy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, would I ordain a 16-year-old? No, no, my dead body is a <laughs> uh, But Spurgeon's the exception because not just that it worked, but it, it had God on it. It wasn't just works in a utilitarian sense, you know, this works therefore must be good. Uh, you've got a better argument than that. This worked because the hand of God was on it. Uh, and Spurgeon is the great exception. I, I cannot think of another one in that category. He's in a category of his own. Uh, Calvin lived, he never knew Spurgeon, of course, he lived 300 years before Spurgeon, and he commented that God may fashion a man in three days, but we must not look for miracles. Uh, and that's the normal response, I think. Spurgeon is a, a kind of miracle. He, he, he was extraordinary. But the, the key thing about Spurgeon is this. If you go back to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at the danger, the danger that Paul warns against is that he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. That's the danger. And, and Spurgeon was so spiritually mature that he recognised that danger. He, he was a 16-year-old who's not full of himself and knows everything. <laughs> he was a 16-year-old who was humble before God. And, and he, he had amazing early success. That's why he was called to the Metropolitan Tab Tabernacle. He was called into London. And, and he preached to thousands. I know preached to thousands. He preached to thousands every week. And, and this success, extraordinary. It was obviously a work of God, the work of the Spirit of God. It, it, people gathered and they heard the gospel from him and were converted in their thousands. And he struggled with that. It didn't go to his head. And that's the secret. He doesn't... <coughs> There's a danger that Paul warns against against here, and Spurgeon was well aware of that. Uh, a man who was not so humble, he would have gone over the edge. He would have ended out a heretic. He would have ended out fashioning his own supporters' club, called it a church, and it would have done more harm than good. So the elder needs to exhibit spiritual maturity before he's ordained. Uh, I, I think that's why Spurgeon is the exception. Um, normally, that's asking too much of, of someone who's just a recent convert. And the third thing, and the last thing for tonight, is that the elder must be respected outside the church. This is an unusual point, isn't it? But look at verse 7. That's, Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. Again, for the same reason, so they may not fall into disgrace into a snare of the devil. The unregenerate man or woman has some capacity to get some things right. Don't fall for the line that the unregenerate have no idea. Sometimes we use that exaggerated language, but uh, clearly here, the, the, the person who is without the Holy Spirit nevertheless has some insight. So we, we, you might remember... Uh, with us for the Jonah studies, uh, the pagan sailors on the boat, on the ship, they tried to do the right thing by Jonah. Uh, they recognised that Jonah was doing the wrong thing. You're, you're fleeing your God. That, they didn't mean you're fleeing the only true God, the God of the Old Testament, the God who created heaven and earth. They didn't mean that. But you should show loyalty to your God. We try and show loyalty to, to our gods, and they would have just seen Yahweh as just another god, but you should show loyalty to him. And they're, they're, they're shocked that Jonah's trying to run away from this god. And then when Jonah says, the only thing that can save you is my death, if you throw me into the sea, this storm will stop. And they, they don't want to do that. Uh, but why? Be because there's humanity in them. You know, there's a sense of this right and wrong that just seems so wrong to throw this man overboard. And so they tried all the harder uh, to row to the shore. And it's only when they couldn't get anywhere that uh, they, they did what Jonah told them to do, throw him overboard. So they possessed some limited capacity to judge. Uh, we've been doing 1 Corinthians in the morning. Again, this was a while back when we did chapter 5. But notice in chapter 5, 
uh, verse 1, it's actually reported that there was sexual immorality among you of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife, who I take to be stepmother. And, and uh, there it is. Pagans don't do that. Uh, he, this is in the church. And it ought not to be. And so he argues for discipline of this man. So Calvin, who believed in total depravity, or the five points don't come from a book by Calvin, but uh, the total depravity, but he still says, in man's perverted and degenerate nature, some sparks still gleam. Uh, and that's behind verse 7. If you went to the man's place of work and you asked what he was like, and there was not a Christian to be seen. But they said, look, he's lazy. He arrives late, he leaves early, he's, he's shoddy. We forever have to do what he's done because he doesn't do it properly. Uh, I wouldn't trust him with anything. He's, you know, we don't know for sure, but it's dishonesty. Uh, uh, or if they said, well, we didn't know he was a Christian, is he? Uh, that's news to us. Well, that should be, you know, flashing lights to you and say, these people might be pagans, these people might not know, you know, Matthew from Revelation, they might not know Genesis from Revelation, they might know anything, but they still have some capacity to judge and there's warning signal there. Now, if they said, oh, him, yes, you know, we go out every Friday night and we get on the turps and yeah, we chase women and we do whatever. And he won't join in. Well, that's a good sign. So you're not following the pagans there. So you've got to interpret this in a sensible way. They have some measure of judgment in some circumstances and the uh, church needs to take note of that. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, it's a rather exceptional case, but it, it's in Scotland, in the Church of Scotland. In 1969... In Scotland, there was a man, James Delson, and he battered his mother to death. He killed his mother, and he was tried as a murderer, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. In jail, he, he professed to become a Christian, and he studied for the ministry in the Church of Scotland. And then he was released. A life imprisonment didn't mean life imprisonment, he got out. And he then went to the appropriate committees and, and said he's done all the studies and he would like to present himself a, as a potential minister. And there was a fair bit of debate about whether this was a good idea or not. And the assembly finally said yes and he was ordained about the year 1986. Was that a good idea? Uh, well, he, he married a woman minister. Well, that wasn't a good idea. Uh, and they divorced. So there was something wrong somewhere. And he died in 2005. But the point I would make here is there is a difference between being forgiven and holding office. It's not the same thing. Now, whether he's a true believer or not, well, I'm not in a position to know. But he, he could could well say, assume he was, that he's genuinely a Christian. He's become a Christian. What do you do with him? It, the, the fact that he's become a Christian doesn't mean he then holds office in the church. Could you use him in the church? Yes, I, I would think you could use him. You know, he could spend his barbecue for breakfast or something. He'd be, he'd be quite something that he, if he was a genuine Christian would have quite an impact on the magic. Whether it's then a good idea to say he holds a teaching office in the church, I would think no. He's it, got too much lead in the saddle. Uh, and you, people can override and say, well, the world wouldn't know and all the rest of it. And, uh, there are difficulties there. And, but uh, that's an exceptional case. They're not usually as bad as that, but uh, 
I, I would think there are enough difficulties there not to have gone ahead. Anyway, let's put these seven verses together now. Try and remember what we looked at a few weeks to back to. Uh, what is an overseer or an elder? What are the qualifications? A man can aspire to the office of overseer or elder, but it needs to be evaluated. You look at his character first. What's he like? Yeah. Is he hot-tempered? Well, no, nah, he's going to do some harm. Yeah. Is he addicted to money or is he a drunkard? Or, you know, is there are character flaws. No, that, 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 that's eliminating. He, he's gentle, he's self-controlled. Yes, they're the sort of things you're looking for. Uh, you look at his home life, uh, his, his wife, if he's married. He, I'm not saying he must be married. I don't think that's the Bible saying that. Uh, but if he is married and, and he has children, and he might be married and not have children, uh, but he's married and has children, and on this he needs to have more than two, doesn't he? Um, it's not just how he looks after his child, but uh, the children, how he manages the household. What are they like? They'd have to be old enough to you know, have children who are old enough to be able to be uh, difficult uh, in fulfilling these qualifications. Uh, he must be able to not only believe the scriptures, but be able to teach the scriptures in uh, some capacity. He must have spiritual maturity and the right sort of un uh, standing with unbelievers. Now, yeah, we have to interpret that properly, but the right sort of standing with a person who's not a Christian can often see, yes, this person is a Christian and, and this person is not. And they, they won't get it right, what they mean. You know, this, they often don't mean more than this person, nice person, this person's not. <laughs> uh, but it will have some capacity for gauging uh, what's necessary. And who is sufficient for these things, for all these things? In one sense, nobody is. In one sense, these qualifications just eliminate everybody. But they, they're still meant to speak to us in a reasonable way of uh, the men who measure up in some way by the grace of God to be overseers slash elders uh, in the Church of Christ. Let's, let's pray. Father, we, we pray that we be guided and guarded by your word in everything, in every area of life where it speaks, that we would hear. Uh, and uh, you ask that you give us ears to hear in this regard too, in Jesus' name. Amen. We uh, turn to uh, Francis Ridley Habergale's hymn, uh, Lord, speak to me that I may speak living echoes of your tone so a uh, good one to finish on given the subject we've looked at
持ち」